Ladies and gentlemen of Luca Nation, we're in for a treat today, uh, and I'm personally excited for this episode, and I know Cage is as well. Uh, we have the one and only Mr. Nat Turner on the show today, and I'm really excited about this episode because I think it's going to be different from some of the others. Uh, today, I'm excited to hear about you know Nat's story. You know, I know he's a big basketball fan. He went to University of Pennsylvania. And I'm curious to hear his backstory. I want to learn more about, you know, the man behind all of the headlines that we're seeing and hearing on the news. Uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what got him into sports car collecting, his journey as a businessman entrepreneur. And at the end, we'll definitely touch on PSA, the acquisition and what he sees for the hobby moving forward. I don't need Are to hear anything else. He's a Quaker. I mean, come on now. What else, what else do you need to know? Yeah, that's, that's I'm it. a dragon, so uh, we might have it out for each other, but... Nat, welcome to the show. I'm really, really grateful that you took the time to uh, speak with us today. Yeah, no problem. It's good to be here. Nat, tell me, uh, how did you start collecting cards? You know, what's the the backstory behind that? Um, I got into cards when I was probably five or six years old. Uh, baseball cards. Uh, this has been like 92, 93. Uh, I was a big Braves fan and Astros. My dad's a Braves fan. I'm an Astros fan from Houston. Uh, I got a, he gave me, he would go on business trips a lot. So I remember he came home one time. Uh, we were living in Europe actually. And so we didn't have like card shows and baseball cards. You couldn't go buy them. So he came home from a business trip from the U S and had a couple Hank Aaron cards, uh, 1975 tops. Um, and then a 1977, uh, tops, um, beat up like you know i still have it in the original screw down and everything i should have brought it for this but anyway so he brought those back and actually pretty soon thereafter we actually mailed hank aaron three baseballs um with a pen and a self-addressed stamped envelope to send back and he sent them back so that that kind of i still have them too my sister has one and my dad has one i have one so that really cemented card collecting for me was was getting those cards and actually not having access to, to like packs and things made it even more of like a chase uh for me so we moved back to the U.S. Uh, when I was maybe in second grade. Um, and then uh, I started collecting um, more so. Like I had the Beckett magazines. I track. I remember like Trot Nixon car, like tracking. They went up from like 15 cents to 50 cents and like all that stuff. Uh, and I pulled a really cool card back then. I pulled a um, – I've talked about this before. I, I pulled like a Kerry Kittle. I got into basketball cards when Kobe was a rookie in 96. And I pulled in 97 a Kerry Kittle's uh, Precious Metal Jim's green card. Uh, out of a pack from a local card shop and uh that one like there are only 10 of them like you know right away it's something super special it's carrie kittles unfortunately but um anyway that got me into like chasing rare like serial numbered cards i was 11 years old and then i started going to shows like I, you know i just never really stopped so i, I started displaying at shows uh, i remember seventh eighth grade i would always have a, a booth um in the houston shows um like george R. Uh, mitchell convention center there was a big one there or brown convention center there with like there's these holiday end shows near the woodlands where I grew up that I always display there. I was at the dugout, which is the local card shop. I was there every day. I was at the mall, <laughs> you know, haggling. Um, yeah. And then uh, LeBron was a rookie in 03 when I was a senior in high school. Uh, had it not been for him, I may have stopped like a lot of people do during college. But because of him, I was I just thought he was the next best thing. So I just started collecting him and that carried through until uh, until I went through college and then just never stopped. So that's my card collecting journey. We were talking yeah. about this yesterday, and this might be a little different direction, but I really want to go here because Cage talked about this. What was it about that PMG set that changed the game? You know, what, what was it that – because we were talking about tops, and we are talking about tops NFTs a little bit, and we were talking about how sometimes in the hobby people get stuck in traditions or companies get stuck in traditions, and you need an outsider to come in and change the game. In many ways – that's what PMG did. So I'm curious, you know, what was it that PMG did that changed the game? Uh, and why was it such an impressionable release? Um, yeah. So, I mean, look, for the junk era, which was till like, what, 90, 89? I mean, the cards were all the same, right? They produced millions upon millions of these, you know, cardboard kind of boring. Um, you know, that was the name of the game for what? From like 1952 through 1989. And then 1993, you know, Tops came out with Finest with Refractors, which was really the first parallel of any substance. They had Tiffany, you know, in the 80s, but those were 
those weren't pack pulled like alongside regular cards. Those were separate sets they would sell. So it wasn't as this wasn't the same thing, even though people think they are. And then you get to 93 of the refractors. That was cool, but they weren't serial numbered yet. Uh, and then you started getting into like in 95, they had like the mystery borderless refractors and like these cool, like you knew right away they were unique, uh, but still not serial numbered. They had some serial number stuff in baseball, but it like wasn't, you know, that of like 3000 and stuff. It wasn't like crazy rare. But then 96 rolled around and it was really Flair Skybox that deserves the credit. Uh, you know, they came out with like Flair Legacy Collection. They came out with Skybox EX um, 2000, which had the essential credentials out of 499. The Legacy Collection from Flair was out of 100. They didn't have masterpieces yet, but they had, you know, Platinum Medallion, which weren't serial numbered, but were short printed from Ultra. You know, they just had some really unique designs and also the cons and ma marrying that together with serial numbers was super special and then you get to pmgs which actually were in 96 but they weren't serial number they also weren't very distinct you get to 97 where they had red and green emerald and ruby ruby and emerald and like you just couldn't i mean first of all the sci-fi nature of the backgrounds uh the foil of the card the metal foil and then you had this like neon red or green and the, the uniqueness of like there's 100 but only 10 are green and 90 are red like in you know this all about it was so cool. I still remember the pack. The, the Kittles was turned upside down. So the cards were facing up, but then like three three uh, cards in was this upside down card. And I slid it over and I saw, uh, I forget the exact number. It was like 003 out of 100. And I flip it and it's green. And like, you know, everybody loses their mind. So you could just, you could tell, you could tell how unique it was. Like as a kid, you just like, you look at it, you're like, that is, you know, that's the card. That's so cool. Essential credentials were the exact same way for me. The pink and and green ones, the pink and purple, and then the green and yellow ones from 97. Rubies were cool too. Like just the concept of a rare serial numbered card in a mass produced pack. Uh, just like back then, like, you know, you, this card shop owners would all be like, oh, that's like one out of 2000 packs. Like you'll never see one of those kids. Like that, it was that kind of allure. Um, you know, they might have one common player in their, in their glass case that you like, you know, drool over. Um, that's just what, that's, that was the chase of it as a kid. So. Yeah. It's funny to hear, you know, the, the everybody's hobby story, right? And I mean, Nats is uh, Hank Aaron, Kobe, and LeBron. So good start, I guess, you know. Um, and it's funny about the timing of it, right? Because you know, you talk about how I, you know, LeBron, and then I went to college. So I went to college '94. So I literally had nothing numbered. Like I left, I left, and it was like, all right, no, yeah. nothing of any value at all. I got a basin full of Drew Bledsoe cards, you know, and none of them, none of them are numbered, right? Um, it's funny too, but I have to add into this conversation. Classic, no one gives them any credit. Do you remember the draft pick sets they had? Mm -hmm. It was '92 classic. They, they, were, yeah. they were hand numbered. The four sport and whatnot. They actually they were like the first ones I think to put like numbered cards in there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they had ones that said this is one of this number, which wasn't actually serial number, but like their autographs. Like, you take a look, guys. You can see these. Like, there's there's some pretty cool autograph cards that are hand numbered. Like Derek Jeter has one in '92 classic four sport. Um, you know, there's some cool 92 classic draft pick Shaquille O'Neal, quote unquote, rookie cards, pre-rookie cards that are hand numbered, you know? So those are pretty cool. And they, you know, they, they didn't really catch on with the major products like that said until, yeah. until a couple years later. And yeah, it changed the game. It changed everything. And why it changed the game is it created scarcity. It created a chase. It was a, it was a scarcity of the cards. It's something that took us out of that junk era to the next era. And I think if you were to fast forward, five, 10, 15 years, PSA did exactly the same thing. Grading of cards did exactly the same thing. Took cards that were not scarce and made scarcity. You know, it creates a scarcity based on grade. Um, you know, so as much credit as we want to give to, you know, to PMGs for changing the game, every couple of years, something else comes along and changes the game. So I have to ask, when you were, when you were a collector, before PSA, what would you think about grading? What do you think? Do you know, you went to card shows the same time I did. I'm sure you heard the same refrain of, you know, buy the card, not the holder. What do you say to somebody who says that to you now? So I got my first card graded in 2000. It was uh, Steve Francis. Uh, it was my guy in 2000. Um, franchise. Up, I love it. Upper deck jersey card that I, you know, I didn't have a lot of money growing up. So I mean, it was like, you know, I was begging for $5 to go to the card shop and buy a single pack sort of thing. And I, I remember I got like $800 in revenue from a card show one day and I used it and bought like $400 on it, spent $400 on a Steve Francis upper deck Jersey. 
card, the, you know, the horizontal one. And I sent it in the Beckett. And just to try, I actually got a Jim Mint 95395 and a nine subgrass, still remember. And um, anyway, the, the concept of, of condition, though, has always been important to me of cards. But for me, it, it doesn't matter as much with really, really rare cards, like a one of one or even the PMG greens. Like I could care less if it's a two or a 10. Um, you know, to me, it's about the card itself. The most important thing is owning the card. Uh, the next most important thing is the grade, but not, and, and for many of the cards I collect it, it, the grade is so unimportant compared to the fact that I own the card. Um, but for some sets where like, you know, a good example is 96 tops Chrome. So I'm trying to do that set in the refractor parallel in all tens. That's, you know, there's, I don't know, thousands of each of those cards, like condition does matter to me as a differentiation when the card is actually quite common, uh, you know, compared to some of the rare cards. Um, but for really key rookie cards, like, you know, LeBron's RPA, uh, you know, out of 99, like I, I have four or five of them, like the grade is cool, but like, I actually, the fact that I have one is like way more important to me than, you know, than is it a nine or a nine, five or a 10. I, I collect those in Beckett, not PSA, believe it or not. Um, so I think it just matters and it's collector's preference. But, you know, to me, like I got into graded cards really in a big way in 2010 where I wanted every Jordan card that, that there's an article written. I wanted every <laughs> Jordan card. That's true. But I actually wanted every Jordan card in a BGS nine, five or PSA 10. So it was even harder. And so, um, you know, I just thought it would be really interesting. Like, and I just, the concept of a pack fresh card that not only is packed fresh, but is perfect otherwise, because it was printed correctly. It had good centering. Like to me, that's just for most cards, that's real for the, more common cards. I just think that's really cool. Um, way, I'm going to get especially... into the Jordan one, but you just said something very yeah. important because we have a lot of listeners, right? And, you know, listen, people think I step on the guests. I'm sorry, Nat. You know, no one's a VIP here. I step on everybody. So here's the fun, right? We have all kinds of people who listen to this. Some people, they don't know cards that well, right? And what you just said is very important because people think if they get a card out of a pack and they send it to you, it should be a 10. And what you just did, you explained it without even realizing you were explaining it, that a pack fresh card does not guarantee that it's a Gem Mint or a PSA 10 card because you know, it might not be perfect coming out of the factory. You know, we all know this now because, you know, sorry, Panini, but the quality control has been pretty piss poor over the last couple of years, and we've seen what the centering looks like. But just because you pulled it out of a pack and sent it to PSA does not mean it's a 10. So, guys, re-listen to what Nat just said because that's important, right? That's – it's – it's a PSA 10, it's a lot of stuff. The card's got to be made right. The card's got to be kept right. The card's got to come out of the pack right, right? You, you can't ding it. So that's actually very important. So thank you for that. And the more important thing is you chased every Jordan. What are you still missing? Uh, actually, I, I don't have a lot of the obscure ones. Um, one of the only, there's two autographs I don't have from the 90s. One's the Epic Signatures from 98, uh, which, I, which I still need. The other is the 96 UD Authentics. Uh, the, or uh, Authentics, yeah, the, the brown, like, wood-looking car. I actually had it, and I sold it. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but um, See, Andrew, yeah, this is mean, what I collectors have, do. We have regrets. <laughs> I do this thing all the time. It's like, ah, oh, I'm moving on. You use the money to pay for something else better. Even that, who, who's missing yeah. two Jordans, no, 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 no. regrets. Every, every card. Those are just the, <laughs> those are the autographs. Yeah, autograph those ones. are the autographs I'm missing. I'm, I'm missing quite a few, like, uh, you know, like I would say less, less known cards. Um, but yeah. One of my favorite Rockets of all time is uh, Tracy McGrady. Cage and I always, always argue about him. Cage says he's well. I'll tell you what Cage says about it. Nat. Let me ask you, Tracy McGrady. That 13, 13 points in thirty-one seconds, insane. Do you remember where you were when of that course, happened? Of course, San Antonio Spurs. I remember that. Yeah, unbelievable. They were playing the Spurs. Tracy McGrady, overrated, underrated, or properly rated as a player and in the card hobby. I think he's underrated in the card hobby. I mean, you look at him like he's he's lower than. I mean bunch of like Ray Allen and these guys get bigger prices than some of his stuff. I mean, yeah, Tracy McGrady. I mean, he never really competed in the playoffs that well. So, you know, he probably is fairly rated from like an overall, like, you know, player perspective, but I think he was like Vince Carter. I mean, he was just so fun to watch. Uh, you know, I personally love collecting him. Uh, I love his 97 tops Chrome refractor. I have like 10 of those the where he's dunking. Um, you know, I think that's one of the coolest cards. His uh, PMG green, where he's sitting on the bench uh, or on the the stool at the like probably Vegas summer camp or whatever it was. Um, that one's like the with the purple jersey. 
Uh, I don't know. I just, I think McGrady's awesome from a collecting standpoint, just like Vince Carter. I mean, both of them probably have the same legacy, like, you know, didn't really accomplish much other than stats and, and a, but had really cool highlights and were like culturally very important to the NBA, you know, Rockets, for all those years. Rockets jerseys, old school Rockets jerseys, new school Rockets jerseys. Oh, old school, the white. And, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Top three Rockets players. Your favorite three Rockets players of all time. Mm. Hakeem, Sam Cassell. Uh, let me think who I'd probably go with. I'd probably go Barkley era. I like Barkley in, this, in the Rockets. Yeah. Very cool. So you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, you know, you, you came up from humble beginnings. But, I mean, if we look at your success over the last 10, 15, 20 years, it's undeniable. And what, what's cool about the hobby, and I think you're seeing this too, you know, as it kind of expands and grows, it's not just collectors, it's not just investors. People are building businesses now on the backbone of the hobby growing. So if you could not, could you put on, you know, your uh, businessman hat? What are, you know, do you have three principles or three pieces of advice? It doesn't have to be three, to be honest. What have you learned over your business career that, you know, maybe you could impart into some young entrepreneurs as they're growing their business. You know, you see dibs, you see Starstock, you see alt.com, you see Top Shot, all of these companies. And I think it's just the prequel. I think we're going to see quite a few more. What, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs in the hobby? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I learned business through cards. I mean, you, you can learn supply and demand, you learn negotiation, you learn, uh, you know, when to buy cards, like timing, like, you know, buying the off season, sell during the season, all that kind of stuff. Um, you learn about marketing, you learn about speculation, you know, betting on a player that could play better in the future and cards value. Go. Like you learn, there's so many principles you learn. Um, I don't know. For me, it's tough because like as a card collector growing up, it was mainly about collecting, but then I also was making money through, through being a dealer as a kid. I don't, I don't do that anymore, but you know, I would say the biggest ones are obviously integrity, you know, don't, you know, life's too short. Like don't mess around with, with games. Uh, I, either you playing them or people playing them with you, just move on. Um, patience, you know, like I remember with LeBron cards, like for 10 years, frankly, they didn't really rise that much in value. And you know, you could be considered dumb for having spent $5,000 on an RPA from like 2003 until 2010, uh, probably even 2011 or 12. And you fast forward today, they're like $2 million. So, you know, I was looked at pretty weirdly for a long time amongst my friends and family for collecting cards and having like a room in our house still dedicated. But like, hey, look, 20 years later, you know, everybody loves cards. Not everybody, but you know, they're all of a sudden. In, so be patient, you know, card collecting, just do what you like you know, collect what you want, collect what you love. Uh, generally, you know, you can make money doing it that way. If you're, you know, don't, don't do what I did at one point and like go all in on Gerald Green. Cause I thought if he was a Houston kid and like, you know, thought he was going to be the next Tracy McGrady, you know, you got to pick the right guys, you know, pick LeBron, pick, pick, you know, but you know, hold for the long term if you can, like I said, be patient. Um, you know, and then I would also say establish some really good hobby friends. Like I have three or four people who, um, you know, like they're always looking out. I'm looking out, you know, for things they want, you know, like we trust each other. We, Hey, what's this worth? You know, we ask each other, you know, Hey, have you worked with this person before? Um, kind of like, you know, not business partners, but you know, people you trust in the hobby because they're this ho hobby, unfortunately, I'm trying to change this, but there is a lot of dark corners to it. There's a lot of, um, bad actors still fewer than there used to be, I think, but you know, you still certainly can get scammed uh, and, you know, stick to a group of people, you know, and trust if possible. Uh, so a lot to unpack say. there, but all I heard and I stopped listening was <clears throat> PSA, PSA says be patient. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. So just a real, kidding. really important thing in there was not just the hobby friends, but we asked this of people who come on and have collecting success. We, you know, when we started out, we were bringing on, you know, wonder kids who are going to their high school prom, but they have seven figure collections. And we'd ask them, okay, tell us what you did wrong. And I remember Adam Rips, Rips was shouting out again, who was right on Giannis mm -hmm. right from the get go. And we're like, well, tell us somebody else besides Giannis who you invested his in. First, his first buy was a Giannis Prism Silver BGS 10, which he showed us the PayPal receipt for $299. 
Yeah. So a smart kid, uh, you know, in, in his teens. And we're like, well, what was what was somebody else you invested in besides Giannis? You didn't just say, I'm putting all my money in Giannis. And he's like, yeah, I put some money in Kawhi too. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> That's not what we're looking for. We want our listeners to realize that, you know, you, you know the old saying, right? You it takes you you break a few eggs to make an omelet, right? You know that's what happens. So Gerald Green, that's the most important part of everything you just said. It's great to have hobby friends. There are dark corners, but even this guy, even 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 the head honcho Nat over here, you know, he thought maybe Gerald Green was going to turn into the next big guy, and it didn't, right? So the lesson there: don't go all in on those crazy ones as well. People make mistakes, guys. I mean, it's not it's not all we're not all perfect, you know. Andrew did pick Tyler Hero. Picked him early on. I picked him early on, and it was a one to two month play. I was very clear about that. So, <laughs> yeah, Matt, you were you were tweeting. Uh, so Darren Ravel tweeted something in February. It was along the lines of I'm paraphrasing here: is NBA Top Shot uh, record sales volume taking market share away from traditional cards. And Nat responded, "Why can't it be both?" Why do you think we think like that? Why do we, you know, when we see this shiny new toy or the the, the the flavor of the week, we always assume it's this or that versus both. Uh, I guess that's the first. And the second part question is, what are your thoughts on NFTs, you know, Top Shots, uh, the main one, but uh, what's it called? Uh, Tops Bunt and Tops NFTs are coming out. It's kind of a two-part question. You know, why do we always think one or the other? And then what are your thoughts on NFTs in general in the digital card hobby? Yeah, I don't know why it's one or the other. I mean, people, I think it's, it's because it's collecting, you know, it's like, uh, top shot mimics like packs and breaks and uh, you know pack odds and insertion odds whatever um you know i think it just got lumped in there as digital cards even though they're not at all uh but you know whatever i mean panini tried the blockchain card where you know you get the d redemption and it's digital and personally think that's the dumbest thing ever but like i'll put that aside um so on the on the nft side well actually first on you know i don't know getting back to hobby friends like i don't like no one I know who collects physical cards collects digital cards as well. Now that I'm not a, like my friends aren't a representation of hundred percent of the world, but you know, anecdotally, you know, I chat with a lot of people, like there's very little overlap. Um, I'm sure there are some, but like, you know, to me, people who collect physical cards do that because they like it or they, they like the market and it's a, it's a fun industry. NFTs is a totally different world. I think it's mainly like crypto people who, you know, uh, uh, view that as a store of value and find a lot of similarities to Bitcoin in it and like that it's intersected with sports and, and that. So I think that's kind of what's happening. I, I just view them as two totally different markets. I'll be your uh, new as, friend that. So I'm a collector yeah, obviously, yeah. of cards for decades and I do the, uh, the top shot NFTs specifically. That's how I got in, but I, yeah. I hardly, hardly do it now. And here's the difference and, and where your, your friends who you're asking about it now um, don't see where the overlap is because it's broken. They just got too big too fast and didn't figure out a way to do it. But when Andrew and I got in, in January, which was not early, you could go online, open a pack. Like you going to any sports card store. Packs were readily available and you had that thrill of opening a pack and trying to get a LeBron out of a pack. Trying to get you know one of the something in the pack that's worth more than a pack. You had that almost gamble aspect to it, right? And you were building a set, you were collecting, you were getting those. And a week into it, a new version came out, a new set for the new year came out, and new packs were available. We were buying packs with different players in them and Lamelo rookies. And a week after that, you couldn't buy packs. It was all just too many people were in it, and now that part's gone, and that was what drew it to me. The, the similarity between the tangible hobby, opening packs and looking for something in the packs, now it's, there, it's just none of it. Now it's, you know, it's bots and it's waiting online to get a sneaker. You know, and hoping that you you beat a robot to get it. You know, it's so if they get back to that, there might be some overlap. Go ahead, Andrew. What's well, interesting that the backstory to that, Nat, is about a week before we jumped on Top Shot, we were uh, doing an episode with Cage and a guest talking about Bitcoin and uh, crypto. Uh, I think it came up because PayPal had frozen his account and how there's middlemen, and it was just all along those lines. Uh, so we're talking about Bitcoin. Cage was like, what is Bitcoin? Explain it to me like I'm a two-year-old. I explained it. He said, now explain it to me like I'm a one-year-old. Uh, so, but anyway, we do a weekly Q&A episode and someone from our community asked, Cage, what's uh, NFT uh, NBA Top Shot? And Cage doesn't like to not know something. So he did, you know, some digging and that led him to sign up. Uh, and here we are. And think about the serendipity of that because Cage is just a true collector. You know, he's a Montana rookie card holder, Jerry Rice, Jordan... Lear, he was a traditional collector that just through serendipity 
got into uh, NBA Top Shot. So I definitely see the validity in what you're saying. It's one, uh, it's crypto guys or collectors, and, and they usually haven't mixed. So, but I noticed, you know, Ravel wasn't, and I love Darren, but he he didn't uh, he didn't tweet, "Hey, I got the Z horses OTB. Are you going to be closing down?" No, he came after you know he came after PSE, he came after the cards, you know he came after the you know the sports card world. So it's funny, everybody's got their own way of doing it. Let me ask that, and you know maybe this will be maybe this will be on your side swipe, right? But I'm a little guy in the hobby. I mean, a lot of our listeners won't agree with that just because you know I've amassed a, a decent sized collection. But I'm a little guy. I loved PSA. I love PSA for the last four or five years. I have thousands of cards at PSA. I have graded thousands of cards at PSA, and I loved one thing about PSA was that. To me, it gave the ability for a little guy in the hobby to color up and become a slightly bigger fish in the pond. They were able to take cards that were, you know, hundred, two hundred dollar cards, and get them in bulk, sell them, and now be, you know, I could get some 2012 Prism base cards and I can turn them into silvers, or I can get some Luca Prism base cards and turn them into Luca silvers, and then maybe turn those into some reds and some blues, and and start to be swimming in different waters of a collection, right? And that was what I loved about PSA. And what I'm hearing now, and not from PSA directly, but from the hobby pundits, the know-it-alls, the people who know, the people who are in the know, that not every card is supposed to be graded. And that PSA is the protector of the hobby, is going to protect us against the junk slab era. So I, as the little guy, or people who listen to this as the little guy, if they were here, they'd want me to ask you, is there room for us anymore in PSA? Is there room for people to buy raw cards at a card show that might be a twenty or a fifty dollar card, and they want it for their collection, or they want it because putting that PSA magic to work, and I've called it that, putting that PSA magic to work, putting it in a slab, getting a ten grade, turns that twenty or fifty dollar card into a hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred dollar card, and they're able to progress in the hobby by doing that. Is that something that you know? PSA understands and is still going to you know, be there for that little guy, or are we moving PSA in another direction? No, we certainly understand that. Um, yeah, to put it short or, or bluntly, yeah, we absolutely want to get back there. Uh, I think most people are familiar with our set registry. If you're a PSA collector, you are probably. And the whole concept of set registry is to collect sets. And that by definition means you have to collect commons and base cards of people that you probably never even heard of. And if it weren't for the fact that you're trying to complete a set, like, okay, here, like I have a uh, Craig Smith 2008 Topps Chrome rookie card gold, or not rookie card, excuse me, gold refractor. I would not get this card graded if it weren't for the fact that I'm doing that set. So and I'm going to be waiting like everybody else, by the way, to get <laughs> that card graded. So, yeah, we definitely want to get back there. It's just an issue of supply and demand, you know, being able to meet the capacity with the demand, you know, that's out there. And, you know, it just got overwhelming. I think we want to get to a point where, and I'm hopeful that we're actually there pretty soon, where we can reintroduce those service levels. We've announced dates for them. Um, we're going to probably phase them in because we can't have a, a avalanche of, of, you know, demand pent up demand when we reopen, but no PSA, we totally get that. Again, we're rooted in collecting. Um, we're not rooted in investors grading, you know, cards for flipping. Although again, we support that we're there for them too, but the, 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 you know, really what drives us is allowing collectors to complete sets. And so, um, we'll get there for sure. I appreciate that. And listen, maybe a pass on the question, but you know, when you're silent, you know, I equate, PSA to a Willy Wonka's chocolate factory sometimes. I apologize if that makes you Willy Wonka. You're not wearing a purple funny hat. You're not making any jokes here. You're a pretty straight shooter. So I could be Willy Wonka, whatever. I'm more of the Augustus Gloop. So uh, <laughs> so here's, here's where it goes, right? When, when it shuts down, when the factory shuts down, and you close the gates, you don't let anybody in, you kind of you shut everything down. Everybody kind of wonders what's going on behind there. You know, no one ever goes in and no one ever comes out. And there's a little mystery to it. And you got the hobby humming. And two things that I've heard, and you know, you, you can you pass on and tell me whatever it is. Um, number one was kind of like a um, they'll get back to the little guy, but it's going to be sort of a collector's club version of the slab, you know, like BCCG for a little while, you know, like a, the redheaded stepchild of grading. Um, they'll have like a collector's club slab, and you can go ahead and do it at a value price, but everybody's going to know that it's not, it doesn't have the real eyeballs of the graders. That's number one. I'm sure there's no validity to that. And number two, this one's getting some traction 
And I got to tell you, as I asked the question, I hate the idea. So I really hope the answer is no effing way. But a PSA black label, like a pristine 10. Um, so those are the two things that get bantied about the most while you're shut down. You don't have to comment on them if you don't, because maybe they're proprietary, maybe they're secrets. You know, you're, you're, it's your prerogative to pass. But that's what I'd love to hear about. Yeah, the first one's not true Rubbish. at all. I don't know. Okay, good. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's. There's no way we would do that. I mean, it is true we want to have a a value service level even lower than our you know pre suspension, even lower than I think it was twenty dollars was our lowest prior to to suspending, even lower than that one day. Honestly, it'd be great. Um, there's no way physically we could do that with our capacity. We're going to be announcing some really cool stuff this year on capacity, uh, which I, I can't wait to talk about, but yeah, the first one's ludicrous. Uh, the second one, it's definitely been talked about. Um, it's not in our current roadmap though. So, right. well, that makes me happy. Uh, honestly, there it's similar, similar. Like, can you imagine if we opened it though? The issue is, you know, anyone who has a PSA 10 is going to just, you know, ship you it in I... to see if. Ten yeah. minutes ago, Nat, what I said to you was, "I'm going to be one of your hobby friends." You did that. Yeah. We're we're not friends anymore. We're not hobby yeah. friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I got it. It's every one of my tens. I got to send back to you. It's a great idea from a business perspective, but yeah, it doesn't make me as a, sitting here paying the premium for the ten thrilled. Um, and P.S. Just to, so you know, my 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 proclivities. I can't stand subgrades. A lot of people like them. A yeah. lot of people think it's, the, but I mean, you know, I love the simplicity of P.S.A. I love one through ten. I love that it's there. I love that it's clear. I love having yeah. everything with that uniformity. And, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter if the if the label is, uh, you know, one of the new lighthouses or one of the old ones with my, uh, you know, with Mo in it. It doesn't make a difference to me. You can stack them. They look the same. You've got some uniformity in the collection. But I appreciate you answering those because, you know, I mean, you could just be like, the hell with you. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, Andrew, what do you got? You got anything fun? I not fun. Time. No, this not is fun. not going to be fun. Uh, I want to talk about <laughs> fiscal, like fiscal responsibility, and like th- I brought this up a little bit before. It, it's uh, we're never taught how to invest money in school uh, unless you're taking really higher end classes. You, you're you're not taught how to compound interest. You're not. We're not taught about wealth accumulation, right? And and I think sports cards are such a great tool for that. Uh, I know you collect with your with your son. Cage does as well. And there's so many lessons that you could learn through that. Let's say I'm coming into the hobby. You know, I'm a college student. I make 15, 20 bucks an hour. And I want to start investing and learning and making some moves in the hobby, but I don't have a big bankroll. You know, Nat, what, what would be the few things that you would recommend to me? Yeah, like I said before, be patient. I would probably recommend speculating on a player you like it's hard in my opinion it's hard to get rich quick in anything i think cards is is the case too like don't go open packs and buy lottery tickets effectively that's not a way to do it the the way to do it is just get smart by again looking at rookie classes and you know picking so like if you picked mahomes in 17 fast forward four years you did great um you know if you picked Zion last year, or John Morant, you probably did really well. If you picked Luca in 2018, you did great. Like, yeah, two or three years is still, in my opinion, you know, that fast timeline. Some people disagree, but that's the way to do it. And it doesn't matter if you can only afford a, you know, a Donruss Optic PSA 9. Like, that card is still going to go up by a similar proportion or percentage as the high end stuff. So maybe not the exact same, but like, it'll go up in value. And that's the way to, that's the way to do it. And cards, if you're if you're dead set on cards, um, there's other little strategies like you know buying off season, selling during the season, buying players, you know Yankees cards when you're in Michigan and selling them in New York. Like you know, there's there's you, you can do stuff like that too. But you know, at the end of the day, it's like stock picking. You gotta you gotta pick the right players. I love the buy in Michigan and sell in New York. It makes me think of the Seinfeld episode where they they got all the recyclables and put them in a truck and tried to drive them to the one state right. where they're ten cents. Instead of five cents, <laughs> that's amazing. No, but I mean, I love the I, I love the idea, right? I love the uh, you know buy low, sell high, all that other fun stuff. I love the don't. It's a lottery ticket, right? Don't go crazy with a lottery ticket, right? I mean, that's another fun one too. It's fun to open packs, but that's not you know that's not going to get you rich. But now, one of the fun things I got to get you back at is <clears throat> we're talking about buy now, and you know you're gonna you it's gonna appreciate, it's gonna appreciate. You talked about a time in the hobby where even if you bought LeBron, even if you bought high-end LeBron, your family thought you were nuts because, you know, from 03 to 2011, 
you know, you had these cards that were $5,000 and they hardly appreciated, right? And there was a period of, of nearly a decade there where even the top cards in the hobby just did nothing, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, we start to see a little increase. And the most recent two years has just been a huge boom for cards, a huge value increase on cards. Um, someone like you who, you know, has not only your own collection and your own, you know, information about your own collection and your own collecting timeline over the last couple of decades, but now obviously sit in a pretty important position for the hobby, you know, what do you see? I've heard people say we're in the first inning, we're in the second inning, we're in the third inning. You want to use a baseball analogy, that's fine too. But I mean, our listeners who a lot of them have just gotten in the last year and, you know, over the last couple of months have seen, let's call it a breather in prices, you know, if, if I'm going if I'm to be generous, right? So what do you see? What do you see for the, the next year, the next two years? And do you also preach the way we do to take kind of like a wider angle view of this stuff, right? It's not about what the card price was in January and, and in April. It's about what the card prices are over a much longer period of time. So where do you think we are and, and what do you say to that kind of stuff? I mean, look, it's impossible to know. I'm not going to claim that I can. I, I certainly didn't predict things would be where they are today, even a year ago. Uh, you know, last February, March, I, when or actually March when COVID hit, I mean, I personally was very nervous. Uh, you know, not my number one concern, you know, but COVID had a lot of other issues, family and stuff that I was worried about. But, you know, that card collecting and cards themselves would become less valuable and because I had a pretty big collection at the time. But the opposite happened. So, first of all, I can't really predict. But, you know, if you look at it today, I mean, a lot of people have entered the hobby. That's the thing I look at the most on the positive side. You look at, you know, kids are opening packs again. Like there's a, I've said this a few times in other shows, like there, there's a card shop you know, or a, a bodega on our street that sells packs. Like they're always sold out. And when I do see them there, their kids, you know, parents with their kids buying them. Like that's, you go to card shows five, six years ago, it was mainly guys like us, you know, in their thirties, twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, you know, very few teenagers, kids, you know, the healthy, the hobby is healthy, healthier than it was. And that's good for prices. You know, if you look at, you know, those, those kids like, like me and you guys, like we grew up, they'll grow up. And when they start, ha they get a job, like they'll start using some of their disposable income on cards and that'll keep prices going. But, you know, if you fast, like on the downside, like some cards that I just can't understand how some of these cards have gotten like the Tom Brady championship ticket auto out of a hundred, like that card is amazing. Is it $2 million amazing? You know, I don't know. Uh, like it's, you know, can barely see the autograph, <laughs> but you know, like I do like that card. Um, but you know, I just think there's clearly an investor, you know, mentality that's taken hold of some of these really high end cards like that. Like, you know, the best card of Brady, the best card of Jordan, the best card of LeBron, you know, you've seen inflation there that, you know, you have to, you have to hope that there's another person after that will pay more. Uh, and so far there has been, but you know, and Jordan's leveled off like the 86 clear number 57 PSA 10, like that card has, has, I would say it's it went way up and then now it's leveled back down to kind of you know, and that happened five years ago, it went up to 30 grand, then it leveled back down to 20 grand. Now it went up to what, 800. Now it's back down to 400, 500. So you've seen these kind of maturations of these cards, but again, like on the really high end, like it's like sports teams, like can people keep paying higher prices for sports teams? I don't know how that's possible given how high they've gotten. I feel the same way about the highest of high end cards, but I look at like, you know, mid range cards, like, you know, hundred dollars to a thousand dollars or whatever, you know, those like, those I, I, I see a great future for, you know, the whatever the Kawhi Leonard, you know, or the Luka Doncic, you know, base not prisms are more expensive than that, but like Donruss cards, like PSA tens, like those things have a future for sure. You look at LeBron tops, you know, Oh three, like those were a few hundred bucks PSA 10 years ago. Not, not even that long ago, five, six years ago, tops Chrome rookie card PSA 10 was a thousand dollars three years ago, four years ago. Now they're 30 grand. That'll happen with the the John Morants and the Zions and all those guys that are coming out now, Luca. Um, so there's still a lot of opportunity, but again, the the highest of high end is where, you know, I'm not selling my stuff because again, to me, it's less about the money; it's more about owning the card. But you know, I'm lucky in that way, I guess. But you know, if you're if you're doing it just for the money on the highest end, you know, it's I can't tell you if they're going to keep going up or not. So it's so. a great great answer that'll lead me to two questions. Number one. Let's talk about your Luca and your John, and your Zion talk just right now about how, you know, we think that some of those cards are going to go up, right? You know, over time, because they're in that, that sweet spot window that you're talking about a hundred to a thousand dollars. Does the 
fact that there's so much supply of those factor in as opposed to like the LeBron mm-hmm. you mentioned. And then the part B of it, if you choose to answer is, um, you know, the rumor mill out there wants to say that, um, you know, PSA is keenly aware of the fact that there is a, a supply of these cards that's significant and that too much supply of high grades of those cards are, um, are, you know, is bad for the hobby and will prevent those things from going up and prevent people from grading. And the, uh, you know, the dark shadows of the world want to say that PSA is not just serving as a grader, but as someone who's population control of certain cards, Lucas, Zions, you name it. Uh, without any evidence at all, I might add, but you know, this is what we do. We talk, right? So, one, do you think that really those cards could maintain you know value over time given the, the, the supply increase? And two, you know, is that something PSA takes into account or do we look at the card? I'm a lawyer, so we look at the four corners of the document and that's it. That's what we look at, right? You don't want to take in any, any, every, any you know, extrinsic evidence, you name it, right? So I always think, you know, a grader is presented with a card, he looks at it, you have your grading standards, and if it's a 10, it's a 10. If it's a 9, it's a 9. Is that not right? Uh, well, on the second one, there's no way that's true. I mean, we are objectively looking at the cards on their merit. It doesn't matter if it's Luca or Anthony Simmons. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, on the on the first question, I do think there's a lot of upside there. I mean, I go back to the hobbies growing. You, more people are in it. That generally means more demand. Um, sports in general, I think, are getting more exciting, better content. Uh, I think certainly when fans are coming back in, uh, you know, th- what's interesting, yeah, is like these car prices have gone up with like the NBA bubble, like which kind of sucked as an experience, right? Watching. So can you imagine when stadiums are full again? So, you know, I personally think just you got to look at the health of the hobby, which to me means, you know, it's not a um, an income producing, like it doesn't pay a dividend. Like if you buy a card, it's not going to make you money indirect or directly. You have to hope that the value goes up. The only way you can hope the value goes up is if some some other schmucks willing to buy it from you in the future. And so, um, you know that that means you have to look at how many people are in it. And you know, you go on eBay. There's more people watching auctions. You go on a Golden. There's more people bidding than there ever were. You know, you you there's more international buyers than there ever has been. There's younger people who, again, you look like that's the problem. Major League Baseball has right with the aging audience, the aging fan base. You know, that's you, the beauty of cards is like you got soccer, you've got um, Pokemon, you've got, of course, basketball is what very international, uh, football is America's sport. You know, I mean, you've got so many different options to play with. Uh, I think sports in general, again, is just, I don't, you know, card values, if the card values were going to go down in mass sports would have to be less popular. And I just don't see that happening. Um, and the cross section again, like again, seeing 12 and 13 year olds buying cards is just so inspiring to me, or, you know, op- it makes me so optimistic for the hobby. Um, you know, seeing them get back into it, uh, like I was when I was a kid, you know, there used to be four or five people deep at the, you know, at the glass cage and the glass, uh, display cases at the card shop, you know, back in 95, 96, like the, you know, you're like looking over someone's shoulder to see what someone's pulling, like that's happening again. Um, you know, like I went to the white plane show with my son, what, two, three years ago, like, you know, it's busy, but like, not really, you know, there's, you know, you could do anything there. Now it's probably a line out the door if they were to have it. Oh, you know, they had probably, it now, definitely. I mean, oh, I it'd be insane. there was a line in the local holiday yeah. show yesterday. So, you know. But the cool <laughs> part is, unlike Top Shot, it's not a bunch of crypto bros. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not like the speculators. There's some of that, you know, the guys waiting in Walmart buying all the boxes before the kids can, which drives me nuts. But it's a lot of, you know, families. It's dads and, you know, whatever with their sons and daughters, like, like I am showing up. That's what's cool. So I, I think all those things make it very, op- I have a very optimistic view of the, I mean, look, I, w- I wouldn't be optimistic unless, you know, if I hadn't done what it, you know, the PSA move and all that. But, you know, I do think there's a really bright future for it. And I think prices too. So, Matt, so uh, pretend you were asked to be uh, a professor at University of Penn, okay? And you're teaching sports card collectibles class there. And you've seen what's happened with the U.S. economy and, you know, printing over 40 percent of the U.S. dollar in the last year. What would you be saying is the future? How are you viewing that from a macroeconomic standpoint? Well, you know, and it doesn't just have to be cards, right? You're an angel investor as well. There's significantly more dollars in the ecosystem. And we all know like the, the junk, junk wax arrow, when you print, 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 it devalues the currency. So what, what would you be talking to the kids about? What would you be educating them on when you've seen that in the last 12 months? Um, yeah, look, low interest rates 
will drive inflation, not just of cards, but of basically everything. Um, you know, you have to, in my opinion, be inflation hedged. Um, you know, that means, in my opinion, buying things that go up with inflation is actually a smart strategy, which means currently buying alternative assets that, you know, experience inflation just like the dollar will. Uh, that means not owning things like, you know, certain stocks of companies without pricing power and, um, you know, at hard assets that, you know, don't appreciate commodities and things that don't appreciate. Maybe commodities are better, but you just really have to focus on being hedged against inflation. And I mean, that's why you've seen cards go up. That's why comics are going up. That's why art's going up. It's that there's more money slushing around and people are they can't make the returns in debt because the interest rates are too low. And so the money goes somewhere else like a river and it flows and it flows to alternative assets and startups that's happening. You know, you can't make money in the stock market, they say, you know, so, you know, and, the, and buying bonds. So you might as well invest in private companies. It's happening everywhere. But again, it's just you invest in the same things that you think are inflation hedged. And I'm not upset that I've, you know, decided to put a, you know, probably, irresponsible amount of money in cards over the last 10 years. But I did it not because of that. I didn't think about inflation. I did it because I liked it. And so, you know, as, as a, if I was a professor of card collecting, I would start with, you know, take off your investor hat and put on your collecting hat first and foremost and buy what you like and what you, the players you like, the teams you like, the, the sports you like. And then, you know, hopefully you pick the right players and they're worth something one day. But probably the minority Turner, these days in that. Professor Turner, <laughs> over the last 12 months, Bitcoin has gone up like 10x and gold hasn't risen in value. I can't understand that. It hasn't gold always been a hedge on inflation? I'm not tracking gold. Go, yeah. go, go look at it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, he's a crypto bro. And he heard enough times, uh, buy what you love, buy what you love, buy what you love, and forgot that this was a card pod. And he's owning, he owns like 11 weed stocks. So yeah. we move along. We move along, Mr. Goldberg. No, so, I mean, I'm a curious that. guy, actually. He is, but I mean, I don't want to get into Bitcoin because it just makes me fall asleep. But so here's the, the fun, right? So so you've already touched on basically almost everything that I would ask. And, and in a way where I think I'm happy. I mean, at least for right now, the roadmap doesn't include a black label, which is great because like, you know, I don't like that. You're not, you know, you, you plan to come back to the, the value guys that are out there. You're not engaged actively, purposefully in population control. So, you know, we have a little bit of time. You've been really generous with us, but without getting into any specific announcements that you can't get into yet about, you know, things that you're going to be rolling out over the coming year. You know, if you were to be able to talk directly to, you know, our listener, people who, I mean, and, and we've, we, we, we've, we've sent cards in. You know, through Rick Nation, thousands of cards over the last couple of months to PSA and only PSA. Um, you know, if you were to say to them, you know, you're, you're a perfect world. You know, you're opening back up in July. You know, you plan on taking care of everybody out there. You know, like what what is the goal for you know the second without specifics? Because I know some of them you can't say yet. But like you know, the second half of 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 twenty twenty one, what does it look like for PSA? Uh, wh when's the show gonna launch? By the way, today's Monday. When is it gonna? Thursday's our plan. Yep. Yeah, so we'll have released this. So we're 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 gonna announce we've bought a company um, in the computer vision grading space. Um, so our plan, like you know, I'm a tech guy. You know, at the end of the day, happen to be a collector too. You know, big part of the vision with PSA in particular is to invest in software. Um, that's shouldn't be that much of a surprise. I mean. You know, it's it's obviously needed. It's you know, PSA has got an amazing brand and reputation, and I think to to continue that into the next ten years or next thirty five years, thirty five year old company, um, you know, it's going to be as much about software as anything else. Um, obviously, we're going to keep hiring as many people as we can, which we're doing. We're averaging 30, 40 people a week that we're hiring, uh, believe it or not. But yeah, computer vision grading. We're not going to eliminate graders at all. In fact, we think they're critical. We think it's a technology assisted grading. Um, there are certain aspects of the grading process that are uh, not just grading, but you know, identifying and researching the cards, um, detecting alterations. The grader shouldn't have to look at a card if the computer says it's trimmed, for example, um, or if the serial on the back of it is back backdoor serial number. Like, why don't waste the grader's time? You know, they've got you know clearly enough cards, you know, to grade. <laughs> you know, might as well filter out the ones that don't have to be graded. 
So, or the ones that don't meet minimum grade is another example. So um, anyway, point of the story is the second half of, of this year for PSA is going to be a lot about implementing uh, that acquisition and growing the technology team to work on with our grading team. Uh, I would just say next generation, you know, technology for both speeding up, but also maintaining, if not increasing, improving accuracy and consistency of the grading process so that we, you know, stamp out the, uh, the bad actors, which, you know, frankly are bad for everybody, not just PSA, but more importantly, the collectors. Uh, and also, you know, take us from the number of cards we're doing today to hopefully two or three times that, uh, you know, in, I would love to be there this time next year. So. Well, it's one way to get rid of a backlog, right? You're trimming off some of the stuff doesn't even have to get into a grader's hands. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So to be honestly, tr trimming's trimming's actually not as big of a deal. Like it's a percentage of cards. It's 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 high profile, but it's as a percentage of cards, it won't make that big of a difference for eliminating those for that they don't have to see them. That is a nice th nice thing to have. But identifying the cards uh, when they come in, you know, so we're going to be announcing, you know, taking images of every card before and after the grading process. That sort of data training data over time as it builds and grows is just going to allow us if we have the right software to just be so much better uh and more scalable um and again these little things like you know identifying trimming again it's a small issue in general it's a high, very high profile one but it, you know it's a single digit percentage or less of the cards but there's like 10 different things like that that when they add up you know you really start to have you know meaningful impact on um you know on the the grading process from a time saved perspective and also accuracy and consistency so yeah. right and staying best in class right because you know you're able to do that people trust the uniformity of the grade people trust the psa label even more yeah so. that's why we're the, that's why we're number one now i mean look the our grading team is amazing I mean, i've watched them do it i mean it's it's really amazing and but you know it's a lot of cards every day right and it's the pressure's mounting we've got millions of cards you know in the same building you know just like literally staring over your shoulder as as a grader as a you know even if you're an unboxing or slabbing like it's just it's a lot of pressure i've been in the office a bunch of times since the deal and you know i feel for them and so you know they need help and and grading using technology is one way to do it we have other things we're going to announce too um but that's that's one of the biggest tools in the toolbox for sure so I want to be respectful of your time, Matt. Uh, you've been really generous. I'm glad we got this uh, got this in today. And congrats on the acquisition. Uh, I'll wrap with this. What are your three favorite accounts to follow in the hobby on the internet? Well, after this show, it's me. But, you know, it's okay. Three <laughs> other ones. I would say Cardboard Chronicles, my man Josh. Love following him. Uh, love Spinatron, Ding Yu. He's, he's my man. Um, I would say Grant Waldorf. I don't know if you, Grant Slayton, Waldorf Stories. That guy. We've had two of those three on, so we'll have to we'll have to meet Grant if uh, you could provide the introduction. Uh, I'd love to meet him. Cage, any anything, any final questions before card, we let? By the way, um, card card porn's pretty good too. He does a good job. I like like and the end, uh, Lamim James. I like him too. They're, they're, he's good. I don't know if you've That's seen that. That's a nice one. starting five. That's a nice starting five. By the way, they're yeah. gonna get, by the way, two two accounts who I love, but they already have huge heads like me. I mean, look at the size of this thing, and it's only gonna grow now that you drop their names. Now, no, so. they're, they're funny, man. We need more. We need more uh, humor. We need less. We, we yes, we need less like. Don't take scathing, us so seriously. Exactly. Scathing, well, no, like scathing anonymous, like you know, like just so dramatic. We need more like, hey, let's like, we can all make fun of each other and let's do it in a respectful way. Like both of them do it pretty well. So. That's right. So can we yeah. get uh, a few PSA backpacks and hats over to Lameem? Do you have any in storage? Because he needs Of course more. we do, yeah. Yeah. We could do that. Yeah, Lameem, we do that. we're getting you some backpacks and hats. You're going to be that. excited. No, I mean, the only thing that I would say is, is listen, so, you know, to, to the people listening to this who are, who are coming up in the hobby, um, to my son even, right? How does it feel? You were a collector, right? You were buying cards. You were ripping packs. You couldn't afford the packs. And now you're sitting in, you know, the, the top seat of one of the, uh, you know, one, of the, one of the major players in the sports card industry. Obviously, you worked hard to get there. But you got to take stock in that, right? You smile every now and again. You take a second to pat yourself on the back and say, nice job. Because if you don't, please do. 
<laughs> no, I appreciate it. I don't look, I don't know. It's not, I, I'm a collector. It's just fun. I'm not doing like, I am surrounded by slabs and I'm not in my office right now. I'm at, at work, but, um, my home office, but, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, my mom reminded me when I was at home, not, not of the, you know, the, she doesn't know much about the hobby, but you know, she, she finds it funny, <laughs> frankly, that I'm still doing, like she handed me the trunk of cards that I, that I should have gotten rid of years ago. Like here, you, you might as well keep these cause you're still collecting. <laughs> uh, it's, it's definitely, no, I, I look, I I'm having more fun than I ever have being in the hobby. I mean, I personally kind of viewed it as a responsibility. I spend so much damn time on, on cards. I might as well, you know, uh, lend a hand, you know, with my, tech and product background to the company that's most important to me, which is the grading company that grades that I prefer for my collection. Um, I think I talked about this, like I called Joe actually at, at PSA years ago to offer support and basically say, is there anything I can do? You know, it's harder when you're not an investor, it's a public company. So the only real way to do it was to do what we did. But um, no, it's, I, again, I kind of viewed it as like, um, uh, Blues Brothers, you know, like a mission from God. <laughs> a mission from God. Uh, don't, don't you know, blast me in here. Don't you blast me in here. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't. It wasn't <laughs> like a you know pure profit seeking thing. It was. It was truly like I view this as very important, and you know, and also will be a ton of fun. And so far, it has been. Uh, there's been some downtimes, like you know, getting the hate mail on Instagram. You know, is is not not the most fun. Um, you know, but yeah. I get it. Listen, I'm guilty um, of it myself every now and again. We'll take some shots at you because, I mean, we have a lot of people listening. We have a lot of people fine. who are – you yeah. know, who are, But I will tell you, this will go a long way because you didn't duck a single question. And, you know, the stuff we're asking you is stuff that people want to know. People are, you know, depending on this. And, you know, they, they, they lean on PSA. They're happy with PSA. They want to continue to use PSA. So, you know, I think they're going to be happy to hear coming out of a shutdown that, you know, things are going to improve – the little guy is still going to be taken care of. They're not somebody that you're leaving behind, uh, which is great because that, I mean, you collect a different kind of cards than most people do. So, you know, one of the things we heard was, you know, hey, that's going to take care of, you know, that's, golden. That's golden not and true. That, all right. Well, well, good. Uh. And, and people are happy. <laughs> golden only wants to sell high end cards and, you know, uh, WCC and Probe Steel, whoever it is, they only want to consign at this level. So, you know, people did say, hey, Nat's a collector of these high-end cards. He's going to make PSA the, the greater of high-end cards only. And that got a lot of our listeners who don't collect high-end cards a little nervous. So they'll be happy to hear that that's not the, uh, that's not the end goal. You're not leaving them high and dry. So we appreciate that. Thank you, Nat. You got it. All right. Thank you, Nat. All right. See you all.